Well, hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to our study on Ruth. We're in Act 2 and in uh, Scene 2, the main scene, where all the action happens. And this act, this chapter, is when Boaz first interacts with Ruth, and it's all going to be done through dialogue. The narrative will intervene a little bit, but very, very rarely, and we're going to focus on that, because it's, it's interesting when he interacts. So like I said, it's mostly dialogue between Boaz and Ruth, where Boaz is dominating the dialogue. You can understand, he's the man. It's not sexist, but it's true. He, he's the one who's going to be coming with a big speech. Ruth will give a little answer. More big speeches, little answer. And then Boaz will have the last word, in a sense, but more through his actions than his words. And we'll see that what I mean. And of course, our point is trying to understand what is going on and why is God speaking to us through their interaction. Why not focus? And we do that by reminding ourselves that this is all about the redemption of the nations that God promised. And like I said before, um, the great redemption moment in the Old Testament is Exodus. But Exodus was built off something else. The calling of, the covenant with, Abraham. And what God set it all up, first and foremost with Abraham, and I'm going to tell you, it's going to be way through, uh, really, uh, I would say, salted in all over the place, this dialogue between Boaz and Ruth. So let's discover all these little things together as we start with Boaz coming close to Ruth. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field, or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. You can feel the tenderness, the compassion, the care of Boaz for this stranger. As she reminds us herself, um, she's a stranger, she's a Moabitess, yet he's shown quite a lot of kindness. We see right from the beginning when he calls her my daughter, the same language Naomi used to speak of Ruth. It speaks of family, yet, again, she's not part of the family of Israel, though. So that doesn't take away from Boaz saying, you're a daughter now. Something beautiful going on here. Of course, this man also speaks to the fact that he was much older than her. That possibly that's why he's also calling her my daughter and not just you uh, woman. <laughs> but like I said, there's a lot of tenderness going on in here when he calls her to just glean here on my field. Take everything you might need here. This is where I start hearing the language between God and Abraham. Because to Abraham and Isaac and others of his descendants, he says, this is the land. Don't go anywhere else. Not until the time of uh, the exodus, I mean, the, the leaving the exile to go to Egypt with, uh, with Joseph, do they leave the land. Again, even when there's a famine in the land, with Isaac, God said, stay in the land. Abraham did it, but you, stay in the land. Don't go to Egypt. There's a sense we can hear that here, right? Especially if he repeats himself. Don't go into any other field. Don't leave this one. That's repetition. When the Hebrews repeat, itself, repeat themselves, it means it's important. So again, stay here. Just like uh, Abraham and his descendants were told about Canaan. He calls you to keep close or to cleave to my young uh, woman. Woman, but servant is the word here. And we saw that language used in chapter 1 when Ruth cleaved to, connected to, attached herself to Naomi, right? A, a kind of a marriage covenant type of thing. And now he's saying do that with her. It's like God saying, You did it for Naomi, even though there's nothing in it for you, giving yourself to take care of this woman. And now go and connect to them, and they'll take care of you. And we'll see more of that as we move along. We, we can see the beauty of it, and as I said, it really sounds like when God came to Abraham, where Boaz is acting as God, uh, providing much blessing and, and, and care for Abraham, yet this time it's, it's not part of Abraham's seed. It's a Moabitess. We continue. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping, and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you. And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink 
what the young men have drawn. Keep your eyes on the field. Sounds like what God said to Abraham, right? Look around. All this is yours. Or Moses. Moses that could not enter the promised land where God was told, go up the mountain, look all around. All of that is for Israel. It's the promise to Abraham. It's like he's saying the same thing here. Look at the specific field where you see my servants working. That's where you can go. It's all yours. Clean all you want. He said, it sounds like God towards Abraham, but it's not one of his descendants. He's charged the young men not to touch her. Sounds kind of weird. Yes, it's the time of the judges where people were kind of evil and, and violent, but still, why would they attack this woman? And that's really what the word means. They like, violently attack her. It could be rape, but it could also just be like beat her. Why? Why would he have to say, don't do that? Yeah, because I hear some of God acting towards Abraham as descendant. Again, again, God protected them from the other evil nations around them not to hurt them. We have a, a clear example of that with Jacob, where his two sons, Levi and Reuben, uh, defended, or I could say, uh, protect, not fought for the honor of their, their sister and killed the people who raped her. Well, Jacob gets afraid. What if the other tribes around them find out about this and they come to kill us? And the narrator takes them to tell us that God had put the fear in the hearts of everyone around them so they wouldn't touch Jacob and his children. See, it sounds the same way now. It sounds like God is saying the same thing. Through Boaz, to, Na- to Ruth, who is not an Israelite. He even goes, he tells her to go and drink all she needs. Well, when you look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they always find water. In a place where it wasn't that easy to find water, actually. Well, we see it again and again through all of them that because they, they seem to always find water, the people around them recognize God is with you. Because all your wells have water. God is with you. Or think of Israel in the desert. God provides water in a place that is desertic, that, that, that has no water. And here she's getting water. Yet she's not Israelite. This is just also looking into the future because later David, thirsty before fighting the Philistine, asked if somebody would go get him water from Bethlehem. And they said there's probably the only one a watering hole in, in Bethlehem because it was so small. He's probably speaking of that specific place. That place his great, great, great grandma could drink from. He wanted us also. It's kind of foreshadowing and pointing towards him. There'll be a lot of foreshadowing, by the way. But for now, we're seeing all this grace and mercy and kindness offered to this Moabitess. How will she react? Then she fell on her face, bound to the ground, and said to him, why have you found favor? Why have I found favor in your eyes? That you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner. I guess the narrative barely intervenes. He tells us, Boaz said, and Ruth says, but now he takes the time to discuss her reaction physically. And you can say, yeah, but it's important. But the fact is, he could have described how Boaz showed up, what he was wearing, or anything. That he had a big smile when he was speaking to her, but he doesn't. He doesn't focus on any of the details except for this one and a bit later with Boaz. That's important. When the narrator speaks up, we are supposed to listen. The fact that he speaks up, the fact that she um, went to the floor and prostrated herself, bound to the ground, which is a um, position of worship. We see it again and again through scripture. Kind of sounds like she's not worshiping Boaz, but in gratitude towards God. She's becoming more and more worshiper of Yahweh. In other words, look, that's what the narrator is trying to show us by telling time to mention what she did here. He didn't have to. He could have just given us her words, but no, he gives her her action because there's, again, a, a sense of, like Abraham, when God offers such blessings and covenant, he worships God again and again and again, like Ruth is doing. So Ruth's reaction is to be dumbfounded by this grace, like why I have found favor or grace in your eyes. Abraham has the same kind of reaction. Anyone to whom God comes and shows such kindness reacts in such a way, why would you do that for me? David, future David, will do the same thing when God makes a covenant with him. Why would you do that? Who am I? She has the same kind of attitude. She recognized this is grace. Even though she was faithfully taking care of Naomi, 
she still sees this as amazing grace. That he takes notice that there's there's a word here that means really particular connection to or, or favor towards. It's not just notice in the sense, oh, there you are. It's really, I want to do good to you. Right? Again, God who chooses to reach out to Abraham and nobody else. It's particularly specific. Why me? Why me? I'm a foreigner. There's that language again. It may not be the word Moabite, but it's the same idea. I'm nothing more than a foreigner. God does not want us to forget that. And we'll see. It's, it's going to continue. She's going to say it in her next speech as well. But let's look first at how Boaz responds to her little question. But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. How you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. Again, it is about the sacrifice. The fact that she was willing to connect and make a covenant with, uh, an alliance with Naomi that she owed nothing to. Her husband was dead. She could have just left. She was right to. But she saw her kindness. And so now, kindness towards her. We could ask the question, how did he know about this fully information, right? He fully told me. How did he know? We see with the sermon, he didn't tell her everything about this. The sermon only said that that's a woman that came back with Naomi. That's it. He didn't know all the details like somebody else told her through the providence of God. God made sure he found out. He found out about the fact that she left father and mother. Interesting, right? It sounds like, like Jesus called to discipleship. The call to leave everything, pick up your cross and follow him. He would hear it now. Of course, it's the Old Testament, but still, it's the same writer, right? The Holy Spirit pointing towards something great days to come. When Jesus says discipleship, being part of the family of God, it's about leaving everything and following me. It's no longer about being just a physical descendant of Abraham. She did that. And that was an amazing thing, though, when you think about it. I mean, she was leaving the Moabite people who hated and were at war with the Israelites over and over again in the time of the judges, where sometimes Moab would rule over Israel, Israel would fight back and kill them. She left that. With the risk of going to Israel and being, hey, wait a second, you know, Moabites kill her. She did that. For Naomi. Take care for Naomi. It's a beautiful thing. And so that will prompt Boaz to pray for her, in a sense. Bless her in the name of the Lord. When he says, the Lord repay you for what you have done. And a full word be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wing you have come to take refuge. I hope you've seen the re repetition of the name, right? The Lord and God, El. Because we saw a repetition of the name in the first act, chapter 1. Naomi, using Almighty and Yahweh, but to speak about how he cursed her and was against her. And here's Boaz saying, I'm praying for some blessing from the Lord upon Ruth. More by this. I hope you've seen it. It's absolutely beautiful. Why? It's a repayment for her faithfulness. God told Abraham, those who bless you, I will bless them. That's what she's doing. And God is keeping his faithful promise to it. But it's still grace, though. She'll still recognize the grace. She'll recognize it again in her next speech. You'll see. But don't miss the full reward is given by the Lord. There's a sense where it is the Lord. As God told Abraham, I am your great reward. I am your shield. I am everything you need, Abraham. Here's Boaz giving it to her and calling her to come and hide under the wing in the refuge of the Lord. That's more prefiguring, uh, foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. Because in chapter 3, she's going to come to Boaz, literally at his feet, under the covering of his robe, and say, I want to put my refuge. I want to come into your refuge. So here's Boaz saying, come into the refuge of the Lord. And she's saying, well, the Lord says it's going to be through you, though, Mr. Boaz. Interesting. Beautiful, right? So here's her second response. Ruth says, <clears throat> I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not one of your servants. Again, get a favor 
in your eyes, right? Grace. She knows she doesn't deserve it. She's like, she doesn't spend both things. Yeah, you're right. I did get good care of, of Naomi and stuff. Thanks for uh, reminding me of that. No, no, no. She still says, this is grace. I recognize this. Good. Even though you speak of what I did, I still recognize this as grace. She even calls him Lord. I don't I. Not to say he's God, but there's still a sense when God offered all these promises and covenants to Abraham, to David, they worship in gratitude towards him. That's what she's doing. Don't miss that. That's what she's doing. Turning more and more towards God to be her God. She speaks of being comforted and how it spoke kindly or more specifically to my heart. How many times does God come to Abraham for the 25 years of waiting for Isaac? How many times does he come and encourage him and speak to his heart? Right in his fleeting faith and in discouraged moments, he comes and encourages him. As Boaz, representing God, did for Ruth. Again, who's not an Israelite. And she reminds him of that, right? I am not one of you. In other words, I'm not Israelite. Twice in her speech, she wants us to remember, I am not of the lineage of Abraham, and I'm getting his blessing. There's something here. This brings us to that last interaction where Boaz will speak mostly with his word, with his actions. In the meantime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. We're not sure exactly will will which mealtime. Was it lunch? Was it supper? Since it's, it's not important. It's never it keeps jumping around for us through this second great act. At first we were with Naomi and Ruth in the beginning of the morning. And then we meet up with Boaz later on with his servants. We know sometimes at the last, she's worked hard from since the morning. We don't know how long though. Then Boaz comes to talk with her. And then we again skip maybe hours and now they're eating. Because the point is not what happened in between and what time is it, but what's happening right now. The narrator wants to bring this right here and say, what I'm saying, that's what's important. What's important is she's been called by, by Boaz to come eat some bread and even dip the morsel. That's extra grace. That's multiplied blessings. It's not just here's enough for you to survive. Here's like the kindness of the Lord being dipped over, like the, the cup running over, if you will. She's even getting grains, grains enough that she will be satisfied and have left over. But don't miss how he calls her to come over and it says that she sat beside the weepers. It can sound again like it's just a detail. But the narrative doesn't give us details that are useless. He gave us, in a span of just a few verses, what happened the entire day for Ruth. And focus on what was important. She sat beside the reapers. She came, it was called to come over and sit with them. In other words, to come be part of Israel. And she did. So that's what I'm seeing. She was called to come to be part of Israel, the people of God, and she sat beside him. She became part of it. She went from, I'm going to follow Naomi to basically become part of it. And it's painted before us by the narrator right here and there. It's painted before us in a wonderful way, and there's more foreshadowing because she was satisfied and there was some left over. Just like when Jesus fed twice a multitude of group, a multitudes, and there was they were they were all satisfied and there was leftovers. See, it's, it's pointed that it's pointed even to to Elisha who does the same thing because his ministry points to Christ. And here's the same thing happening here too. But again, not for Abraham, but what he sees for a Moabite, a stranger, a foreigner. See, we take for granted the fact that anybody can become a believer, right? That's the Christian faith. So we forgot that it started with one man and his physical descendants. And then to be circumcised, become part of the family of Abraham. But then God wasn't going to finish that though. He had a far greater plan through the sacrifice of his son. That what we have is not something that was clearly testified of in the Old Testament. And yet there's glimpses with Ruth. And don't miss how she sees it as grace, not deserved. 
Now, of course, he'll accept me. No, no, no. Yeah, but God's grace isn't good. No, no, no. It is grace. Not deserved. The same way it is for us. It's not just, I'm a son of God, so he should. No. It's because of Christ you are accepted and proved and loved because of his death on the cross and his resurrection and his righteousness that covers us. His sonship that is ours. But we should always have that same attitude as, as Ruth. Again, she goes back to, this is grace. This is grace. I don't deserve it. This is mercy. Of course, we know it's, it's all because of Christ. So let's not become presumptuous, but be more like Ruth, with that kind of attitude of worship and appreciation of saying, I don't deserve this. I shouldn't be a part of this. Thank you, Lord, that you did this. Now, with this, brothers and sisters, be blessed.